Is it too loud, Jack? It sounds very loud, yeah. It's good, it's good, okay. Okay, everybody, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Karsten Fries, I'll be a moderator today. I'm gonna talk about cybersecurity. Um, there's a lot of topics you could talk about in cybersecurity. We have addressed a few of them before at Nupi, and we will continue to do so. Um, but uh, the topic today is about um, securing a global free cyberspace. In other words, the, the contradictions or the challenges between freedom and security. Um, there's a pressure, there's a drive to secure internet more and more as we are seeing more and more threats coming. There's a whole industry of internet security, cyber security developing, emerging from the private sector as well as from the governance agencies. At the same time, we may ask if this is potentially challenging the freedom of information and the freedom of speech, which is the whole internet is based upon. And as you, most of you probably are aware, the technology we use to fight cyber crime uh, can also be used to, to, to combat freedom of speech in countries that we don't like to compare ourselves with. There's a challenge here. Um, we are extremely pleased to have one of the Europe's uh, most well-known and, and most recognized uh, experts on cyber security today, Dr. Miriam dunn Cavalty. She has written extensively on cybersecurity, and she's doing a fantastic job of translating this very technical stuff to the rest of us so we understand it a bit better. And that is that's not always so easy. Um, you work at um, your lecturer for security studies and a senior researcher in the field of risk and resilience at the Center for Security Studies in Zurich. And as I said, published, published a lot uh, on, on these topics for the last few years. And, and, um, and, uh, and as I said, the will is one of the few voices in Europe, at least, who have, in the world, I would say, who actually managed to maybe counterbalance some of the kind of militarized language that we have tended to see in cybersecurity and especially in international relations politics. So, with no further ado, Miriam, the floor is yours. Uh, you will introduce us, uh, introduce us to these topics. Then Björn Svenungsen from MFA has been kind enough to follow up with 10 minutes comments from his point of view, Norwegian point of view, and then we open with Q&A. So, Miriam, please. Thank you very much for your kind words, ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure to um, talk to you about cybersecurity and uh, liberty and the tension between security and liberty. Um, as I did not entirely know how much knowledge about cybersecurity there is going to be in the room, um, I'm going to have it fairly basic. Um, and, you know, we can go into various directions in the Q&A because there is so many topics that you can actually pick out. I also chose the view of the state, but I will challenge it because I will show that, first of all, the state per se, you know, if you think of the state as an institution with different political uh, bodies in it, doesn't necessarily agree uh, on what uh, the cybersecurity should be and what the aims and the goals should be. I'm sorry. Uh, that this switch is off. Sorry. <laughs> I'll have to restart. <laughs> because uh, we don't want you to get seasick. This presentation is, uh, uh, technique is called Prezi. I don't know whether you know it. And it's been known to make people seasick. Uh, so I have to be very careful <laughs> in how I actually use it because I don't want you to uh, run out. Okay, so once again, I'll uh, try to look at the state and I will try to first give you an impression about what are the different countermeasures that are in place uh, to actually get more cybersecurity. So I'll not focus so much on the insecurity and more on the security side. Um, but I will also show you that uh, different actors within the state have different viewpoints. And that's one of the problems when we then look at the overall security, because what some of the actors do is actually making cyberspace more insecure. And I'll talk you through that. Um, first, a few words on cyber threats, cybersecurity to situate the whole thing. Uh, this is a so-called world cloud, and you see um, how different or how many different aspects there are under cybersecurity and cyber threats. Um, you know, it's about services, uh, obviously about com computers, it's about criminal use. So it's a lot of what we are faced with is criminal, is the crime, 
Um, but obviously, we also hear a lot about cyber attacks. There is a national security dimension to it. So it is kind of all over the place. It's also about your own private use of the internet. And you, you know, if you have a virus, it's a problem that you have yourself. How does this all connect? If we um, look at it more from a risk perspective, we see that there's a double risk. And here it becomes interesting for states and state security. We have a technical level, and it's very important to understand this technical level to understand what cybersecurity is about. Um, we have huge dependencies on computers, everyday use, but national security importance, our critical infrastructures are computerized to a large degree and are dependent on you know, data flows. Often they are actually manipulated from the outside. I mean, in, in a good sense, people try to steer them from the outside, but computers are ruling uh, this, this world. So there's a lot of dependencies on uh, the functioning of computer, and there is a lot of vulnerabilities in the information infrastructure. So there's holes. The whole computer infrastructure is inherently insecure for a variety of reasons. And these vulnerabilities will never go away. And this is obviously a very ungood combination. Plus, in addition, there is a lot of talk about so-called cascading effects because these systems are interlinked, sometimes in ways we don't fully understand. A little failure in one uh, system could potentially cause a failure in another system. And that's something that security experts are very much afraid of cascading effects that we don't fully understand. And um, just basic system failures, it doesn't necessarily have to be an attack, could be the cause of that. But obviously we have actors, I call them potentially malicious, uh, because you can't just you know, know theoretically who, who might be malicious, but um, there is a lot of people who want to use these vulnerabilities for their advantages. Once again, ranging from crime up to national security, like strategic uh, interests. And uh, that's also a certainty. There is a so-called offensive advantage. Uh, defense actually is just very reactive because all these vulnerabilities that are there, uh, many of them are not known. And they become known at the moment of an attack. And then you start reacting to your incident. That's also a fact that people grapple with. Now. In itself, the two obviously are an issue, but the interaction is actually the, the main problem, so that we have vulnerabilities that can be exploited. And um, in this combination, we also have seen in the last few years that ICT, which stands for Information and Communication Technology, has an enabling function for a lot of these uh, bad deeds in cyberspace. And with a lot of activities, they are old, theft, you know, blackmailing, all these kind of things are phenomena that we know, but they have a new dimension and they sometimes make these misdeeds easier or the information infrastructure makes it easier and harder uh, to catch the people. Once again, that goes from individual, you know, um, uh, criminals to organized crime up to maybe terrorists and state actors who use the infrastructure to spy or to, you know, uh, what, do whatever other uh, ugly things. Now, that if you are now a state actor and you think about how to actually bring security into this space, because that's what states want to do, you have a problem. The, the power to actually resist this vulnerability moves away from you. Infrastructures, one of the numbers that you usually hear, 95% are in the hand of the private sector. I don't know how it is in Norway, but this is kind of the number that you usually hear. 90 to 95 percent are privately owned. States cannot secure these infrastructures directly. Um, also, for a lot of them, because they're transnational actors, a lot of the big companies that you know own Im important infrastructures are not even national. So you even need you know you need transnational solutions and obviously international solutions. But the power to actually use these vulnerabilities has also moved away from states. They also have the power, but it goes down even to individuals. Um, that is another problem. How do you deal now with a huge range of different types of actors that are potentially malicious? And the key problem for the state is that they cannot secure this space alone. And uh, we've, we've known that for a long time. Um, but it's one of the key issues still since the 1990s when that issue was first on the, on the agenda. Um, 
how do you make sure that you, you know, reduce your vulnerabilities and how do you make sure that you take incentives away from malicious uh, non-state actors, but also how do you get the private sector uh, to agree on a level of security that you as a state see as beneficial um, or, or as, as enough. So how much security should we get and who in the end should pay for it? That are some of the, the very basic issues. Now here, um, there is an attempt to bring s um, actor types and threat types together. Now this morning we had a seminar and we discussed these typologies and how flawed they are. They are, because when you have an incident, you usually don't know uh, what kind of incident or what kind of category it belongs to still. I think to just show once again what kind of phenomena you're faced with and what the threats are, and that the economy and the strategic side are very closely interconnected. And I think you can also see that a lot of these activities, you know, begin to become one and the same, and you sometimes don't know anymore. So a lot, there is a lot of um, hybridity between the crime and the espionage market, that you have a lot of um, competent people here that sell their services and sell vulnerabilities, etc., to state actors to then, you know, use them st strategically. That shows you how difficult the governance of this space once again is. Here, um, you have non-state actors that also have very, you know, uh, different um, strategic aims from, from a normal state actor. Um, also here, there has been a lot of talk about the same issues. You have a market here, uh, highly competent, innovative people here that, you know, th theoretically can be used in all the other spheres. From a state perspective, this is once again a nightmare. And I think one of the issues uh, that every state is grappling with is different communities. And they're kind of represented in these different um, categories. So you have a technical community. Uh, they're not necessarily people that are employed by the state. Sometimes they are. They have a very specific view on, on what cybersecurity is. It's a very down-to-earth technical perspective. You have malware and you need to get rid of it. So this is usually not very political. But you also have actors the antivirus industry, which is a very interesting actor because they define a lot about what we know about cybersecurity. And it's an actor that we don't know all that much about. And a lot of these people are hackers or used to be hackers and they found the companies and are now the good guys. But obviously, who is good and who is bad is also quite hard to define. So th there's a lot of knowledge in, in this industry in actually also defining these categories. I think that's a, that's a very important uh, point to make. And I mean, there's no antivirus industry that's completely state-owned state or state-owned. In Russia, some of the antivirus industry are a bit closer to the state, but these are very private actors with very private uh, actor needs. They want to maximize profit. In terms of the threat, um, the actors, you would focus on purely on hackers here, without calling them bad or good normally. Now, it becomes a bit more political if you move up. I grouped crime and espionage together. Espionage could also be a bit further to the right, and I think in the latest way the discourse has been framed, that has also happened. But here you have different kinds of threats that you're interested in. Um, you're interested in, in criminals as a typology already, people that have criminal uh, incentives. But here you also already have these cyber mercenaries, these people that are for sale basically and, and might you know, uh, give their services even to states. Um, the target I think is also interested that here you're obviously very clearly focused on where you can get money if you're a criminal actor or on information that you want to get, usually classified information, the information that is you know, uh, worth a lot that you might want to sell. Here you have another community, you know, in the state that usually deals with these issues. Also two very different actors. And on the right-hand side, you have that which we normally call the military and the civil defense um, communities that differs from, from country to country. But they often develop their uh, ideas of what is dangerous and how to actually counter it together. So um, there is a lot of discussion about, um, I'll come to that, resilience and you know how to protect critical infrastructures because the main threat on the this lens is actually the disruption of critical infrastructure through cyber means. And you know all these scenarios of what it means if a country doesn't have power for three 
uh, days, for example. And the main threat, catastrophic attacks on critical infrastructures, and obviously state actors are there. And it means different kinds of, of actions. Oops, that would have been, yeah, there we are. So, <laughs> now if you split that up, and now you see I, I split the civil defense and the strategic military um, apart, you actually get a grid in which you can show the different uh, countermeasures and what is talked about. Obviously there's overlaps, but still you see that these communities, they usually have different kinds of tools geared towards securing cyberspace. The only common thing, and that's very important and people tend to forget, is very technically, technically oriented. Um, it doesn't matter uh, whether you're you know, in a law enforcement department or wherever, if it's about disruption in the computer, you need to know about the very basic technical tools if you're a system administrator. It doesn't matter whether you're a military guy or a law enforcement guy. You need to know about information assurance and you don't need to know the details, but that's an old discipline. This is IT security. And obviously it can have a national security connotation, but this is very basic and it's the sphere of the technical people that know how to secure networks and that understand malware and all these kind of uh, bad things in cyberspace. Now, uh, this is another very powerful protection, protection concept, and we don't have time to discuss them in detail, but I think it's important to see that another focal point, now on a more abstract level, is critical infrastructure protection, critical information infrastructure protection, with this main struggle of public-private partnerships, I'll come to that, and this concept of resilience, trying to build more resilience into societies, the ability to actually uphold uh, normal, you know, the normal day uh, workings of our society, even though there might be disruptions. And resilience, the concept actually assumes that there will be disruptions. So you don't try to prevent, because in cybersecurity it's impossible to prevent, you say things are going to happen and we need to be able to deal with it as a society as well. Now, the very interesting thing about public-private partnerships and critical infrastructure protection is that you have two different communities there um, and two completely different views on what needs to come first, and that's one of the problems, and you find that all over cybersecurity. So, um, one of the biggest issues in critical infrastructure protection are industrial control systems, CADA systems. It's those little, you know, machines that actually control uh, infrastructures. Now, they are built with, you know, uh, a different mindset than IT systems. They need to be available all the time. It means they need to run. So security basically doesn't matter. And that's one of the big problems. How do you get security into the most vulnerable uh, bits, even though they have different um, ideas of actually what needs to happen on the information assurance level? And you know, there's uh, issues of trust, et cetera, that we might uh, want to uh, discuss. I have put cyber arms control into brackets because I don't like the topic, but what we do see, and I hope you will talk about it afterwards, there's a lot of international initiatives right now to stabilize behavior in cyberspace. So a lot of diplomatic, I would say old school attempts to get states to agree on you know, what is good and what is bad behavior. And in addition to all the other stuff, this is happening. And I think this, um, just to mention uh, the OSCE, there is uh, confidence building measures, very basic. But you do see that indeed this helps focus, you know, the discussion on the international level. And this is an agreement between many, many, many different states um, on, you know, what should be the core issues at, at least. So there is, I would say, a lot of hope now that we're on a way to get, um, to some kind of code of conduct or whatever. Now, this shows you how broad it is, how many different actors are involved. Um, and I now want to look at this you know, big question of how much security is enough, but because these actors don't have the same goals. Most of these actors don't have the same goals. If you look at the private sector and the, and the public sector, they talk, they're talking about different levels of security. 
Um, but even if you talk, if you look at you know what the, uh, the crime prevention wants to do and what the military actor wants to do, they once again have completely different understandings of cybersecurity. And um, I would say even worse because that's also something that I'll uh, that I'll mention. Within like core national security, the intelligence community and the military community often do not agree on what cybersecurity means and what you should be do, what you should do in, in cyberspace and what you shouldn't uh, do. There is three big areas of tension in cybersecurity. That's the one we're going to look at. But there's two others that we don't have time to discuss. One is fairly technical, it's security versus functionality. Because if you have a, a system and you need to put in four passwords, it becomes very, very annoying. Or if you have, you know, I don't know how it is with internet banking, but in Switzerland we have about three or four different steps. So you need a, you need a code, you need a password, then you need a card, and even a code on your mobile phone. And this will increase in the future, because whenever you get one on top, you can be sure that one was broken by a criminal actor. So it, it becomes more and more complicated to be secure, and this is a hassle. And if you think about it in economic terms, this is a problem for the industry. How do you get security without you know, reducing the functionality and without making it so annoying that people actually you know, stop like switching off to security? That you see very often. Because like antivirus scans, you know, they take so long. They're so damn annoying if you have an old machine. And so people switch them off. And, and that shouldn't happen, obviously, you know, that, that makes everything more insecure and it's because it's annoying. And the same, and it's connected, is the security versus cost argument. That's the most important one when you talk to the private sector. Security costs. Who pays for it? Must it be the state? Should it be the company? So there's a lot of discussions about how you get incentives out there, you know, for more security. And um, yeah, so far we try to have it, you know, people do it voluntarily, but that doesn't work in a lot of areas because of, of cost calculations. And in the end, if you're a company, you know, you need to make sure that you have profit. Okay, so security versus liberty is the topic that we're interested in, uh, interested right now. And there's a few aspects. I mean, some of the, you know, surveillance, etc. I'll come to that, is a very obvious one. But I think there is a subtext to it that I'll also want to get into because it links back to these different communities and their different views of what cybersecurity is. I wanted to give a few basic ideas about this tension. I mean, you, you all know it, uh, but still to kind of refresh what we're up against and to also show that there's no one clear answer. Now, in terms of theory, you know, this, this trade-off, it's very clear that as soon as we have states, there is a trade-off. Uh, that people, whoever that is, gives away some of the power to the state, and especially individual liberties for the security of all. And you get back security from the state. It's like a deal, a social pact. Um, so you give away power to the state so that you don't have that state of nature so that mo you know you don't kill each other and you get back you know freedom property uh, you know security in terms of your life etc but that also means because this is an interrelationship that there can be no freedom without security and no security without freedom and that shows you that it is a tricky balance between the two and that's why we usually say you know trade off how much of what do we actually want now, you must give away some liberties for the security of all. What does that mean exactly? And you know, how, how is this negotiated in society? That's a very important point. Here, um, you actually have something that strengthens uh, freedom. You can't, because you have to have both. There is a point where there is too much security, where freedom actually you know, kind of falls away. That's a very dangerous point, and many, in, if you look at it in history, it happens often, or it, it used to happen often. Um, that's another of the, you know, of the, of the tasks. As little security as possible, but as much as necessary. Once again, where is that balance? And that's another one that you hear often. You should only give up some of the liberties if that e really means more security. Hugely tricky. How do you define more security? Security for whom? 
Is it for everybody? Is it only for so, uh, certain groups? And that shows you, you know, how difficult this negotiation actually is in different groups. If you look at it in terms of a scale and you have security and freedom on the one side, um, you do see that, you know, it's a balance, but these, you know, different sides of the scale, they tilt sometimes. And this balance, or wherever it comes to, to stand, is a process. It's a social political uh, process of negotiation. It's possible that, you know, in the future we'll have a lot more security in cyberspace because we see a need for it as a society. And we are at the point where that is actually happening. And you see that whenever something happens, uh, not necessarily in cyberspace, but also in the, in the real world, that balance, you know, is disturbed and it needs to, ne to be negotiated again. Terror attacks are very typical incidents that then also have um, a repercussion for cyber uh, for, for how we, you know, how much liberties we actually guarantee also in cyberspace. So there's an interconnection there. Now, obviously we have new problems that make this balance much more difficult. This is well known, so this is Cold War. We knew an actor, capabilities, intention, that was well known, so we knew the threat and we, if we wanted to do intelligence, we basically knew whom to target it at. But that's obviously gone. So we don't know much about actors' intentions, capabilities anymore. We know some, but that, you know, in some areas, we don't know all that much. And we talk about homegrown terrorism, we talk about radicalization. So there's people that suddenly become a threat. So in the literature, we say we, mo we moved to risks. Now, uh, many say, well, yeah, there are just basically uncertainties. And in terms of security, the uncertainty is about the who, the what, the when, with what, and why. And if you, you know, look at this for cyberspace, yes, this is exactly what we are at. If you believe that basically anybody who has like technical knowledge can do very bad things, how would you, how would you know what they're doing? You can't actually see cyber capabilities, it's software, it's code. You don't see it, at least you saw missiles, you know, they have a certain size. But these things can be programmed. I can sit in my, in my cellar and I can do a very bad thing. So what that actually leads to, and that is fundamental once again for this tension, is that for, for the state or the state actors, in principle, everybody is potentially suspicious. How? I mean, we now have to prove that we're not bad because we could potentially be radicalized. I could be a hacker. I could be a disgruntled you know, person that you know, suddenly hates my state. So I'm a potential danger if I have the knowledge. And that obviously actually leads to something uh, that is very much cyber related because we're in a, in a sphere where there is a huge amount of data that you can actually collect. So you have, we have new tools now that help us with that uncertainty and everybody who has the means actually jumps on this train. It's the, it's the big data train in general, but we're actually only at the be beginning. So the data generation um, of, of societies is huge. So, you know, this is a smart toothbrush. It's on the market. It actually measures how you brush your teeth. So it speaks to the internet and it tells you how well you brushed your teeth in comparison to yourself, but also maybe your neighbors or whoever signed up for it. And believe me, these are like, and fridges, you know, you might already have a smart fridge. So they tell you when they're empty. So they go like, you need to buy milk. It, it sounds kind of, you know, yeah, it's fun, and we like these gadgets, but this is what the, what the private sector is actually pressing on us. Cars are smart. They speak, you know, uh, with all the other cars around them. They tell you where the traffic jam is going to be, et cetera, et cetera. There's a huge amount of insecure, or like unencrypted data out there that people can grab, and they do. Everybody who can gets that data. It's private sector actors and it's public sector actors, intelligence communities. Um, so they collect. Now this is, you might know this, this is the, the, the famous NSA um, prism. Um, very interesting graph, you know, where they collect all the data. It's not the only actor that does that. It's not, we now know that the NSA does it, but basically every, you can assume that everybody who can takes as much of your data as they possibly can because it's interesting and they are actually now able to do things with it that they uh, weren't able to do before. So something that we uh, need to look at is data analytics and it's hugely interesting because we're moving from a sphere where we used data uh, statistics 
on old events um, to and we're moving to data that looks at patterns, emerging patterns, and tries to predict things from big data patterns. Now, for individuals, this could mean this, the following, and it's obviously a minority report scenario, if you know the film, but it's actually um, you yourself might not even know that you're about to radicalize. But the computer knows. Why? Because in your patterns, in where you, you know, whom you talk to, what you bought, what you looked at, you become suspicious because the patterns show or the experience shows that it is more likely if you behave like that, that you be become radicalized. We're not quite there yet, but uh, you know, the, the whole um, idea is actually that law enforcement and in intelligence communities is going in this direction. This is where the, the money goes. Now what that means for democratic control and all that kind of stuff that we need to think about. What it means for law. How can you act if you have you know, a computer flags you as a potential terrorist in 10 years. What does that actually mean? How, you know, how can somebody act? Should they act? All that kind of stuff. Very interesting. And this is in the future. Not that, it's not that far off, actually. So a lot of money is going into these kind of um, technologies now. And a lot of um, public state actors and, and uh, services within state are actually also going that way. Now, I think the interesting thing here is that um, we have the old dilemma between security and uh, liberty is still there, but we have a slightly new one. Um, so first of all, we have a fundamental insecurity and that increases insecurities in security politics and the feeling of being insecure. So the reaction usually is that you do something against it. And what can you do? We have a lot of data that can be collected, so you go get it. Um, and this is another big problem in this uh, balance issue. Most people actually generate that data willingly, um, either because they don't know or because it's very convenient. The smart toothbrush, super, you know, I don't even need to think anymore when I brush my teeth, the toothbrush will tell me. Um, plus the new algorithms that um, are hard to control because we don't know them. Um, so there's a combination of feeling insecure, data that is out there, that is willingly generated, and that is actually leading to less liberty in the end. Um, so that's a, a topic that people need to become aware of. And the last thing that I want to mention is this. The problem is, it's linked to the whole question of, of insecurities that are proliferating and you know the ability to use cyberspace for strategic importance for grabbing data for getting as much data as, as possible um, so there is more data collection than ever before you, all kinds of data how much that's worth is a different question but there is a slightly frightening tendency in this because you are so insecure because cyberspace is becoming more important and because you want as much data as you can, what do many actors do? They're now actually using the vulnerabilities in the infrastructure to get more data. They install so-called backdoors. Um, they put malware into you know, networks that are important. Um, we know that the NSA also tried to you know, break encryption codes to get even more data. Now that is one of the worst things that is now actually happen, happening. So in the name of more security, there are state actors that make cyberspace that should become more secure under a lot of national security uh, ideas, less secure directly by actually exploiting, so-called exploiting these vulnerabilities and in leaving these vulnerabilities open because they want to collect more data. And that's one of the conundrums that we're actually facing in this field that leads or stems from different viewpoints uh, on what cybersecurity should be, on these different uh, tensions that we have. And if th this is not uh, solved, then we'll never have a secure cyberspace. Thank you very much.
Yeah. Oh, I can stay. Okay. <laughs> Internet thing. Yes. Um, hello. My name is uh, Bjorn Svenningsen. I am the coordinator for cyber issues in the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. It's a position that was established only less than a year and a half ago. Um, since we uh, noticed that uh, cyber issues were sort of dominating more and more on the international agenda on, uh, on various um, uh, arenas. Uh, thank you very much to Miriam for, for a very interesting uh, um, um, intervention uh, or a speech. I have a few comments to that first, and then I was asked to say a little bit about Norwegian positions in this uh, landscape. Um, uh, and first, a few comments that I just noted uh, down when I was listening to you. Um, you mentioned um, levels, and uh, yes, I certainly agree there are s uh, several levels in, um, in cybersecurity. Um, you mentioned the technical level and the actor level, and um, uh, many countries would argue that there is also a content level, uh, and that's where the political part comes in. Um, uh, the Russian Federation, for example, they, they usually operate with a pyramid when they speak about this, um, consisting of three layers, where the uh, bottom layer are rules and regulations, basically international agreed um, Regulations, for example, uh, coming out from the ITU, Geneva-based uh, International Telecommunication Union, a UN organization. Uh, and then you have the middle part, which is the technical stuff, and then the top part, which is the, the content stuff, the content. And, and they would argue, and many countries with them would argue, that the content on the, in the cyberspace is a matter of national interests. It's a matter of national uh, um, regulation. Uh, as, as you are probably aware, some countries are more interested in, or at least at least interested in the content in cyberspace as in the systems. Uh, I think it's fair to say that Norway belongs to the group of countries that are more interested in having the systems work, and not so much interested in the, uh, what's in there and the content, but there are many countries that are more, or at least very interested in what's in there as well. I'll get back to that in a moment. Um, on diplomatic efforts ongoing, uh, there are many, many, many. Um, uh, a U.S. Uh, colleague of mine, he usually says that uh, there are so many summits in cyber these days that it looks like the Alps, mm -hmm. because there are so many, many meetings, and uh, you sort of have to uh, choose uh, which one to go to, what are the important ones, which one can you uh, leave behind. I'll mention a few of them. Um, um, on the multilateral side, that's another issue that I'll get back to, this whole squeeze between the multilateral and the not-so-multilateral uh, processes on cyber. Uh, that's a dilemma, actually. But on the multilateral side, uh, there is something going on in the UN uh, National, uh, General Assembly. Uh, under the first committee, for those of you not uh, known to the committee system in the, in the General Assembly, that's the committee dealing with... Uh, War, peace and war, uh, bullets and uh, hardcore security issues. Uh, there is a um, um, there is one resolution that is raised by Russia has been raised by Russia every year since I think 1998 uh, on security related to ICT issues or something like that. I don't remember the exact title of it. But under that commit, uh, resolution, it has been established something called the United Nations Government Group of Experts. UNGGE is what it's usually referred to in, in, uh, when this is mentioned, which be, until this year belonged, uh, consisted of 15 uh, countries discussing, among other things, how uh, international law shall apply in cyberspace. Now, why is that interesting? Because for many countries, including Norway, uh, we have been very consistent on saying that international law should apply in cyberspace because we do not want new international instruments specifically for cyberspace. Why? Because we fear that if we start negotiating on new international instruments, we will end up with something that is worse than what we have today. 
And why would we do that? Because the majority of the nations in the world today are not democratic. Which means that we would have a vote, for example, in the UN, we would lose. I'm not talking about the Security Council. In the media, we usually hear about the Security Council, but this is not an issue that is dealt with in the Security Council, but in other UN uh, organizations, which are consensus-based, which means there's a vote, we lose. Okay, it's as simple as that. So we don't want uh, new regulations dealing with, with um, behavior in cyberspace because we fear that it would uh, contradict many of the universally recognized human rights principles, for example, that we, that we uh, uh, like to forward. Uh, so that's, uh, but the interesting thing on this uh, UNGGE, I'm, I'm tracking away, how much time do I actually have, 10 minutes? Yeah. Um, uh, is that it's basically the only place in the UN system where the United States are actively discussing issues uh, in cyberspace, together with uh, Russia, with China, and with other important actors. Um, and it's it also in the UNGGE that Russia and China, for the first time and the only time so far, has agreed that international law shall apply also in cyberspace. Now, after, after they did that, this was a report from July or June last year, they have somehow, you know, trying to, to adjust it a little bit, but, but uh, the fact still remains that uh, they have uh, agreed that international law should apply in cyberspace. Important, uh, important for, um, for many countries, particularly important for Norway, actually, that the international law uh, apply, for example, the law of the seas and so on. Um, so that's UN, and you also have something going on in the second committee, which are dealing with ICT and development. Second committee under the United Nations General Assembly. I'm still in New York. Um, that's dealing with uh, how, how developing countries should uh, uh, get closer to developed countries in terms of uh, IC, the use of ICTs and the use of, uh, let's say, cyber. Um, that's also an ar arena where many countries are trying to uh, get in some text dealing with how to regulate the internet and so on. It's a long, big story. I don't have time to go into all that now. Um, and in the third committee in the new, in, uh, under the General Assembly, that's uh, dealing with human rights issues. There is an important resolution being uh, actually decided upon one of these days uh, on uh, surveillance and privacy. I'll get back to that in a little second. So that's uh, in, uh, in New York. You have some issues going on in the OEC that uh, Miriam mentioned, uh, dealing with the uh, confidence building measures. Uh, the 55 member states have agreed on, on some, um, some measures taken there. In addition, you have the so-called London process, which is uh, an annual big cyberspace meeting. The last one was in Seoul in Korea to 2013. The next one will be in The Hague in, in the Netherlands in April next year. It's called the London process because it started in, uh, by the Brit the Brits started it in 2011. Uh, that's the London process. You also have uh, something called the Net Mundial. I don't know if you heard of that, but that's a Brazilian -ish initiative which was taken uh, last uh, year and there was a meeting in Sao Paulo this year where uh, states and the private sector and the technical community and the civil society are uh, agreed on a certain certain principles on how behavior in cyberspace should should be um, and then you have uh, a few other few other meetings there was a big meeting in china last week where i attended uh, that uh, uh, where the chinese are trying to sort of be more forward leading in in trying to steer the uh, direction in how we should uh, regulate i said regulate uh, the cyberspace but this is all sort of on, uh, mixed together, and uh, the, the main issue here is, is the multi, what my, we might call the multilateral versus the uh, many stakeholder uh, approach to how the cyberspace should be governed. And the, when I say many stakeholder, I mean uh, it's not only a matter of the states, it's a matter of private sector in particular, it's a matter of the technical community, academic community, etc. And that uh, um, uh, is a challenge for us, uh, representing the governments. And we are used to meet in diplomatic circles and uh, agree and disagree, and somehow we find a compromise and we agree on something. That's not the case in cyber. So it's a very challenging thing for, uh, for us in the foreign ministry and, and in the foreign governments as, a, as such, that we have to include the, the private sector to a much, much larger degree. As was mentioned, some. 80, 90 percent of the internet, for example, in the world uh, is owned by private uh, interests. 
and not by states. Um, some countries uh, disregard this to a larger extent than others, but uh, um, uh, it's, it's a challenge for also for us. Um, some countries are also very reluctant to talk about uh, uh, arms control. You mentioned arms control, arms control, Miriam. Um, uh, China, for example, uh, does not like to talk about arms control in cyberspace. Uh, they say that if we talk about arms control, it means we're actually pl planning for or preparing for cyber war, whatever that is, uh, which we're not. And it also indicates that we are um, developing offensive capabilities in cyberspace, which not all countries agree to that they do. Many would say that they don't. I think in Europe, I think it's only the Netherlands of the, of the let's say, uh, yeah, of the European countries that have act actively gone out to say that we are developing offensive capabilities. And then you might ask why the Netherlands? And that's a good question. Um, and, um, but, but that's a national uh, decision they have taken. Um, yeah. And also one, one comment to what you said on the, the, your last point. Um, it's been a lot of talk about states exploiting vulnerabilities and, and how states are um, conducting espionage, etc. And you also have a division there where uh, some states uh, conduct uh, information gathering uh, for security purposes, uh, while others see little difference between collecting uh, information for security purposes and collecting information for commercial purposes. And that's a, that's a major difference. For us, that's a major, major difference. And for most countries, let's say in the, in the Western world, uh, that's a big difference if you do it for security purposes or if you do it in order to assist your uh, national companies in, in uh, earning more money. Um, but that, that difference is not always there for all countries. And um, that's, a, that's a big uh, issue and a, and a huge challenge for most of us, this uh, theft of intellectual property. And uh, we are working together with many, uh, many states on that, on how to, how to solve that and what uh, can be done. And it's also a, tec it's a technical issue, but it's most of all a political issue, actually. Um, so, uh, a little bit on, uh, on the Norwegian positions in all this. Uh, our bottom line is that uh, we work for an open, secure, and free cyberspace. It's very easy. Uh, but it's not as easy as it sounds, because we, uh, the word free is the big difference. I mean, for many countries in the world, they, uh, they work for, a, for an open and secure cyberspace, but they avoid the word free. And if you listen to, for example, um, uh, well, the Russian, Chinese statements in various forests, they will not use the word free ever, if they, at least they haven't done it so far. I wish they would, uh, when they talk about um, uh, cyberspace. Um, the difference is not that big that you might think sometimes, but, but uh, uh, one main uh, uh, area of interest where we differ is uh, freedom online. What should people be able to see, to say, to do, to trade, uh, etc., uh, online, and what should be the state uh, responsibility and what should not be the state re responsibility? Um, and uh, 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 yeah. I think today it's, it's, uh, it's fair to say that there is uh, at least six, uh, what we can call, powers that should uh, try to agree on all these issues. Uh, that's the EU, the country of EU. Um, it's China, it's the United States, Brazil, and Russia, and perhaps also India. Uh, but as of today, there is no um, mechanism for where they can agree on these questions. There's no uh, institutionalized mechanism. Uh, so some countries would say, but we have the UN. Why don't we use the ITU or other UN institutions? Uh, but then other countries would say, no, we can't do that, because in the UN, you only have states. Per definition, the UN only consists of states. You don't have companies there, of course, or private sectors or uh, research institutions. Um, yeah. So that's, a, that's mainly a, a political and not so much a, a, a technical issue. I um, mentioned privacy and, and surveillance. There is a resolution uh, being agreed upon uh, this week, probably, in, in New York, uh, where Norway is among uh, the 
countries of a core group um, that is forwarding this resolution. Uh, after we had some discussions whether we should be a sort of part of that group or not, and we decided upon that we, we should, uh, because we think it's an important issue, and it's also an uh, issue that touches uh, upon this very fine uh, balance between uh, security and freedom, which is the issue of the, of the, the topic here today. Um, uh, and the, and the, tr the fact is that we have, of course, also our own uh, national security interests that we, that we try to take care of, and um, uh, it's important to find the right balance. So surveillance is okay to a certain degree if it's proper and proportional. Hmm? And that's what, I mean, most countries would agree upon, but the difference is what is proper and proportional. Uh, and that's why we have actively been engaged in this process uh, in order to find, find a good language there. And now I think we have uh, done so. And this resolution that will be, will be uh, adopted now, it looks like on cons by consensus. Um, it, uh, first, it recognizes, um, uh, we recognize there that further analysis and discussion is needed uh, on the impact of surveillance on the right to privacy, including also in that the questions on how to make sure that um, uh, limitations have a legal basis, and that it's proportionate, proportionate and necessary, as I mentioned. And that states uh, must abide by these principles also when acting uh, to preserve national security uh, interests. And second thing in that resolution, I, I briefly mentioned that, um, it emphasizes that surveillance and interception of communications, as well as collection of personal, personal data undertaken on a mass scale, risks violating or abusing human rights. It doesn't necessarily do that, but it risks doing that, uh, in especially then the right to privacy. And then in our view, the states can have some uh, human rights obligations, but they don't necessarily have it, but they can have uh, also when conducting surveillance activities outside their own territory, because that's been an, a controversial issue here. Uh, but this is an area where, where further discussion is, uh, is also needed. And then the third point um, uh, is that this resolution addresses the uh, aggregation of information, what we often call metadata. metadata. Um, and metadata can uh, give an insight into individuals' behavior, social relationships, private preferences, and so on. Um, and the collection of metadata can bear a particular risk uh, to interfere with the individual's right to privacy. That's the exact text we will use in our explanation of vote. Um, but it doesn't necessarily do so. So the point I'm trying to make is that we're trying to find the balance, that it's not necessarily a human rights violation, even though we do surveillance, but it could be. Um, yeah, I think I'm using all my time here, so maybe I should just take questions instead, if there are any. Well, thank you, Paul. Uh, Bjorn, I don't have to know about the feedback. Um, I don't know, Miriam, would you like to respond quickly to some of Bjorn's point before we open up? Oh, yeah, uh, obviously I, I, I agree. Yeah, how could I not? <laughs> but thank you very much for um, you know, giving some more background on the diplomatic side of things, because it's a, it's a very important one. And um, also, thank you for pointing out this difference between the more technical view or the sy system view of security and, and you know, the content side. Uh, because that leads, like, diplomatically, that leads to this fundamental disagreement also on what cybersecurity actually is. Mm. You know, in terms of the terminology, there's still no uh, agreement on what the states are actually talking about. One point that I would like to make about privacy, from a technical point of view, more privacy can mo mean, directly mean more security. How so? Privacy usually means that you have control over your data, and there's not a lot of data that other people can just gather about you. Now, data for criminal purposes is absolutely necessary. So to find out a lot about you know, individuals and systems is done through data that is available. Now, if you think about just a lot of, like much more privacy, like all the information is encrypted, um, it's very hard to actually gather information about different people and systems. You'd have more security automatically. Now, why is that not done? Because many different actors don't have an interest in encrypted data. The main drivers uh, in, in this field have been private companies. 
and that's one of the big fields, you know, where they hope to get money is obviously from your data. Like all the internet services have, been, many, many internet services have been free, but they're actually not free because what we give is data and they use it for commercial purposes. That's how they make money. So as long as we just think everything is free, and it's the same with these gadgets that are going to collect our data, they're cheap. But other people actually use them to do research. It's market research. They find out about our preferences, et cetera, et cetera. So companies, most companies don't have an interest in encrypted data. Um, for example, uh, also like search engines like Google, they want as much data as they can to know what you're looking for, for example. Gmail as well. Um, they want to see what kind of content you use so that they're able to, you know, use targeted advertising. So that's a problem that we have, even though everybody knows that you could make the internet more secure with just much more encryption at all levels. So that's another tension. So it's not only the states that do the surveillance and are the bad ones, but you also have other interests in there. So there are solutions, but they're not possible if you know uh, we don't radically basically change the way we, we use the internet and also how we see it as this you know thing that yeah that basically everything's for free. You don't pay uh, for many 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 services. Just as a side note, that there could be a direct link between privacy and security that many don't even see. That reminds me of my, one of my favorite articles from The Onion, that false newspaper that <laughs> it was that the CIA had decided to close down all programs because they have Facebook, don't need anything else. Mm -hmm. right. Okay, um, <laughs> we had touched up a lot of things from the principal ones to the more diplomatic what's going on, and they all cover the same issue. So we open for any questions you would like, please, anyone? Please state your name and affiliation. You will get the microphone in a second behind you. Microphone. Thank you. Um, Joachim Malmqvist, uh, Norwegian Refugee Council. Uh, I've been following the net, uh, the, the net neutrality, the um, uh, where companies are uh, paying other companies to uh, see to that YouTube and Facebook get priority on the web. How do you see that playing into uh, our ability to to stay safe? Mm -hmm. when net neutrality becomes something that was yesteryear and, and today we're going to have more focus. You said 90% of all the internet is being run by, by uh, commercial companies and now we're actually moving more into individual companies seeing exactly where our data is going and exactly what we're doing. Mm -hmm. How's that going to affect our ability to have liberty online? Um, probably not in a positive sense, uh, because, I mean, it depends if you have choices or not. That is often, you know, one of the topics that comes up. Um, but if you, if, if you don't even know that Google, for example, depending on, on where you sit, so what your IP address is, gives you different search terms back. And if you use the same computer and with the same cookie, it actually learns from your search terms. So some things you don't even see anymore. And that's happening right now. I also know that there is a discussion among certain companies. It's not legal in many states, but... Uh, train, uh, train companies do it and plane companies do it, they start fiddling with the price. Um, so, for example, you know, um, there is discussion in the industry that depending on where you have your computer or your IP address, they, they know how wealthy you are because there is statistics. I don't know how it is in Oslo, but I'm sure you have, you know, uh, neighborhoods where it's just known that the richer people live. So if you use the Internet from a neighborhood like that, you would get higher prices uh, for the same goods online. Now, um, yep, it's a matter of, you know, regulation also, whether we want that stuff or not. But in terms of liberties and in, if we believe that we should be able to get all the information that we want, basically at the same, you know, uh, it should be the same for everybody, then we're definitely moving away from that. So we're in a phase where uh, co the, the, the commercialization of data is still ongoing because the big data craze has only started. And many, many people are in, in investing in this. So I'm pretty sure we'll see much more of that kind of stuff. Now, it just puts more pressure also on individuals, I think, because there's always ways in actually breaking these, you know, normal systems in hiding your IP address or all that kind of stuff. But it means that individuals need to become much more IT savvy that, than there usually are. And that, again, um, poses other issues for, uh, you know, 
age, for example, is one of these issues. You know, how do you then educate the, the non uh, super internet savvy. Also in the future, if I think 40 years uh, into the future, what will, you know, what will the world look like? Will I still be able to, to deal with these tools? Will I understand what's going on? So I think that's a big challenge. And I see that as a, uh, also a challenge for states in terms of thinking about, you know, what aspects of commercialization need to be looked at very carefully. Because they have neg they can have huge negative, they don't have to, but they can have huge uh, negative uh, influences on, on privacy and liberty. Yeah. Thank you, Bjorn. You want to add anything on that or should I open more? Uh, no. I okay, anyone else? Wait. If not, if you think, I will. Okay, sir. Back row there. Hi, Bill Tolliver with the uh, U.S. Embassy here. Um, I was at a conference not long ago, and I heard uh, several human rights NGOs express concern over their recent Right to be Forgotten case, mm -hmm. um, thinking that uh, if you sort of extrapolate to infinity a right to privacy, then you impinge upon uh, freedom of information to a significant degree. And they were really concerned about this to a degree that sort of surprised me. And I wonder if I could get your thoughts on how that, uh, what the thinking is in the field about that right now. Yep. Um, it's a tricky question because um, I think that in general, you know, there, the, the discussion about the right to be forgotten is that we leave a lot of data out there and we have no control over it. So there is one aspect of this is to get control back to the people so that you should have control over your data. In, especially in Germany, that's also a very strong movement. Um, that is also, you know, in terms of the, the privacy aspect, very important. You to know where do you generate data and how can I get control if I want to. Now, the problem is obviously in uh, whom you give the power to decide who, you know, should have the full uh, information on you because it doesn't necessarily, information is not necessarily neutral. And there it suddenly becomes a social and political issue. And I think the issue here is that in general, we agree that we should have um, you know, a say about what kind of information we leave where. But there, there's once again a balance to be found uh, between data that we generate and have control over and data also that might be produced in newspapers and stuff like that about a certain person, which is not necessarily the same. So it's a content, I would say it's a content versus uh, technical uh, debate once again. Because you then, if you say, well, I can delete all newspaper articles about myself, you start, you start meddling with a different way of expressing things, which is not data related. So I think that's where this fine line comes in. It's a similar discussion that we have, you know, on the what type of data should be controlled. Technical information, to what extent, or uh, content information that has a lot of different contexts also, uh, which might actually be necessary for society even to know about a certain person. So I think that's that's the issue that it can be manipulated uh, to a degree that that can be bad if you don't find information about uh, certain processes, people, etc. anymore. But I think normally what you see is that um, in in the process of then you know um, f usually the, there is a process of finding that that balance. So let's see how how this um, is going to continue. But I see where that concern comes from because it's about the control of content in the end, and that's dangerous. Yeah. If I may jump in here, Bjorn, uh, I was curious about uh, this resolution I talked about, which seems to be rather unique uh, from the third committee. I don't know, could you, do you know which other countries are going to be tabled? Is it too early to say? Uh, is it a purely Western thing, or is it kind of broad? Uh, uh, it, yeah, I can, what I can say about it is, is that the, it started last year. It was an in initiative from Brazil and Germany. Uh, and it was tabled uh, first time last year. Uh, I think the first country that uh, came on board was North Korea. Um, and uh, after a while, it's quite a lot of other countries uh, came on board as well. So in the end, it was uh, a lot of, uh, of uh, countries behind it. I don't recall everybody, but it was a long list. But we were uh, having uh, quite uh, extensive discussions for... for uh, some time there before we decided to uh, go in as a co-sponsor. 
that was last year. This year we are playing a more active part, uh, and one reason for that is exactly because we want to make sure it doesn't go too far in one direction or the other, but that it should stay a balanced uh, resolution. So it's um, it's the second year it comes out uh, this year, and um, it's still the Germany, Brazil, Norway, uh, I think maybe Switzerland is in this core group. Um, but I don't have that full list in, uh, in my. But it's it's a very open process, and anyone who who likes to join can join. It's uh, mm, on on that resolution. Okay. Are there other questions? Yes, sir. Just the way to the microphone, please. Yes, thank you. I'm somewhat unaffiliated, but background in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, retired. Uh, thank you very much for two very interesting uh, introductory uh, speeches. Uh, my question will take you a little bit away from Manhattan Second Second Committee, First Committee, and Third Committee, and uh, into the world of, of, of somewhat perhaps higher diplomacy, talking about regulations, arms control. And if you go to the kind of cyber world where the parties, participants are developing capabilities for somewhat offensive purposes. Uh, uh, then we get back into the intelligence world where we have to distinguish between intentions and capabilities. So my question would be this. In this brave new world, usually people will engage in arms control measures if both parties have an interest in controlling certain offensive capabilities which the opposition might use against them, or also to save money, which is an important thing. Now, in the brave new world of, of Spicer, uh, cyber offensive capabilities, uh, would you know if there is any kind of preliminary contract between, let's say, the high powers, the most advanced industrial military powers, to come to grips with questions where there might be a mutual interest to control reduce t tensions which might be entailed in developing certain very offensive capabilities in cyber, let's say, war, cyber espionage, cyber warfare? Or simply, is that an area not quite developed yet? Thank you. Um, good question. Um, there is, um, I think there are at least two, two, issue, two answers to that. And, uh, one is that the, high power, the major powers, they have bilateral agreements. Uh, so Russia and the United States, for example, they had um, uh, developed a uh, bilateral agreement where they used these 24-7 uh, um, hotline centers that they used during the Cold War for, for an, uh, nuclear, um, if, if a nuclear incident re occurred. So they could uh, inform each other very, very quickly that this was an accident or this was a whatever and not an act of war, for example. And that's now being used for, for cyber incidents. Uh, it used to be, at least. Uh, I think it's still, still the case um, after a bilateral deal. Uh, the same goes for uh, China and the United States. They have bilateral uh, talks, uh, and, and also Russia and um, uh, China, I think, and several others, I'm sure, as well. And, uh, and the Russians came to me when I was in China last week and asked for Norwegian-Russians uh, consultations on the same issue. Uh, I'm not sure if we'll, we'll do that yet, but um, <laughs> that the, the point is that um, information, quick uh, exchange of information, is maybe more important uh, on cyber issues. Um, when it comes to uh, uh, building offensive capabilities, um, then um, uh, NATO uh, has a policy who says that for now they shall not develop uh, offensive capabilities. NATO shall be a defensive alliance in terms of cyber. Although the, uh, the various uh, member countries in the alliance are, of course, free to do whatever they want. And some of them are developing, as I mentioned, Netherlands as one example, and, and others as well are, are developing uh, uh, offensive capabilities. But then again, you have the question, what is offensive and what is defensive in cyber? It's a bit harder to see than in conventional, uh, conventional warfare. Um, so, so that's it. Uh, there are um, uh, certainly uh, states that are interested in, in reducing uh, the tension in cyber. I think today, I think it's, it's more or less uh, a common agreement among states that cyber war as such will not be an issue alone. 
cyber warfare will be um, a part of a, of a larger uh, operation, uh, usually, at least in terms of, if you think of military use of, of cyber as an offensive capability. Um, but still, uh, the, the, this uh, conference I mentioned in China last week, then the Russian representative there, which is a very close aide to, to the president, he called the, the, NATO, uh, the new NATO cyber policy, which was adopted on the summit in Wales only uh, not so long ago. When was it? September or something? Um, he called it uh, dangerous and unpredictable. NATO's new cyber policy was dangerous and unpredictable. And he said that in an open spe speech, so I guess that's the public information. But um, uh, it also says something about how, how you view these, uh, these issues. And that, that NATO policy, in case you don't know it, says that a cyber attack against one of the alliance member countries of a certain degree is to be considered a, an Article 5 situation, I mean, as an conventional attack. An act of war. An act of war, that's right. That's right. And they say that, uh, for example, what happened to Estonia in 2007, uh, that would constitute such a, such a level. But it should be uh, assessed on a case-by-case -case basis. Then. I don't know, Miriam, if you want to comment on some <coughs> questions. Yeah. yeah. Um, what I find interesting from an academic perspective, if, if you look at the world of diplomacy more analytically, um, and Björn has mentioned it, what is really interesting is that there are agreements now. That there is much more common ground than there was five years ago. Um, because I think the stakes are, people have just realized, statesmen have realized that the stakes are higher and that everybody is starting to do stuff that's potentially destabilizing. So this agreement that international law applies to cyberspace, and there's various bodies that agreed on that. We also have the Tallinn Manual um, from, uh, it, it's, well, it's a group of experts uh, that in a NATO-affiliated uh, center came up with a very detailed uh, description of what, um, you know, war looks like in cyberspace. And it just helps stabilize expectations. It's not full agreements, but at least it, it moves, you know, um, cybersecurity into well-known areas, and that's good. Um, and I think in terms of where we might end up in, it's most likely a code of conduct um, and not much more because arms control measures, you know, the, the whole question of verification, et cetera, are so difficult that I don't see that there's going to be an agreement, that there's not, I don't think there's going to be an agreement for a long time because it would mean giving up a lot of information and states are not ready. And this dual use uh, problem is, is huge. Uh, you know, looking at the malware it will not tell you, or at the program, it's impossible to see whether it's offensive or defensive, because uh, an offensive tool can be very much defensive for you. So it's very, very, very hard to, you know, do the classic arms control, take the classic arms control scheme and apply it. Also, um, because you obviously have the private actors to somewhat integrate. It's not a state domain. I mean, it's, it, if, if states invest a lot into cyber offensive measures, fine, they can program. But a lot of the knowledge is not in the hands of the state in, in most countries. So that's, that's the difficulty. It's about knowledge in the end. And I think where I see uh, the need or like uh, the, there is one specific market that is at the heart of or that's the most dangerous thing is that market on so-called zero day exploits. It's the most strategically valuable vulnerabilities in the information infrastructure. It's once again knowledge about where you could attack. There is a market and because intelligence communities are also buying on that market, the prices have skyrocketed in the last few years. And there's a few very interesting um, ideas in how you can actually uh, re regulate that market. It's about incentives, about making sure that people have an interest in actually finding these vulnerabilities and disclosing them so that somebody needs to shut them down. It's once again fairly technical, but that's what at, what's at the heart of this whole debate. If you find strategic vulnerabilities and you close them, you can't have cyber aggression. That's basically the, the bottom line. So I think it's important to, that I, I agree that the world of diplomacy is very, very important, but don't forget the bottom layers, uh, which you just don't get on board with these, with these old tools. So there's various layers of, of governance structures that we'll, that we'll actually need. Uh, I see a little contradiction here, because on the one hand, we 
we need to open a free cyberspace, and and that's important. Uh, we cannot have governments and agencies and private sector kind of limit it. Uh, at the same time, we need them on board because to be able to 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 technically do it, and and also in other ways, because ninety five percent is controlled by private sector. Uh, we need them on board to to guarantee that freedom. So, for the, if the state is going to guarantee our continued freedom and liberty. Uh, they cannot do it alone. They have to do it together with the private sector and the private, from Google to the more malicious private security companies that are playing both sides, perhaps. Um, we need them on board. But how, how are we going to bridge that? I mean, there are, there, there's private, the private sector is not that easy to handle, is it? Mm. I think what's important is to see that the private sector is not the private sector. There's many different actors out there. We first need to understand, you know, how they tick, basically. What is their interest? I mean, critical infrastructure owners are uh, one group that is very diverse as well. But it's different. So the, the dialogue between states and private infrastructure owners is a very specific one. And you need to find a level of security that is national security is a national security interest. This is national security in your country, basically. The other di uh, dimension is slightly different, and it's different actors. So if you look at the commercial actors, be it Google, you know, be it all these companies that live on free data, they're usually not critical infrastructure actors, and they need to be handled differently. And I think that's a chance, but it's also making it much more and more complicated, because often the important companies are not. I mean, how do you even? talk to Google, you know, who is Google? <laughs> you, have, you might have somebody in Norway that says Google, but, you know, uh, they're not Norwegian. In the end, you know, they, they fly to Seattle often, etc. So it, it is that you, this old problem of transnational companies and how you actually <coughs> bring them into, you know, national security, um, yeah, corporations, partnerships, because you would want partnerships that both sides should get something out of it. And that's been very difficult. And how do you get, you know, um, a, a, a benefit for all in, in this kind of field? And there's not many solutions out there that work yet. And one, uh, one other point is that um, uh, when we talk about arms control and military issues like now, uh, often we're talking about closed systems. You know, military, the, the military systems which are separated from the internet, for example. And not a part of it. And, uh, and uh, while the cyber security in terms of criminal uh, activity, etc., is very often uh, linked to the internet mm -hmm. uh, and, the, and the global web. And uh, well, that, that's two different things, basically. But in, in this international forum you attended, like the Net Mondial, would have uh, the, both the, the civil society and NGOs and private sector. And mm. who who selects who can be there? I mean, who who who? Uh, it's very nice that you open up, and it's not only government. It looks very nice on paper, right? It's you know, politically correct, if you like. But but still, there's a power dimension here. Well, it's not only politically correct; it's necessary. But. Uh, um, who, who decides who to come? I think on, on NetMundial, for example, um, uh, anyone could register. There was a deadline for, for registration, and anyone can register before that deadline. Um, some uh, governments uh, received invitations as well, but I think that was a part uh, of the Brazilian uh, um, administration's uh, wish to make sure that enough governments were present. Uh, but that was an interesting and very much uh, multi-stakeholder meeting where you had four lines, four microphones in front of the podium uh, with a sign on each of them. One said governments, one said uh, civil society, one said the uh, technical community, and the fourth one was uh, uh, private sector, I think. And then you had to stand in line and first come, first serve. And uh, if it was the US ambassador or the, or the Norwegian ambassador, for that matter, which wasn't there, I was there, but uh, uh, it, it didn't really matter because uh, you were standing in line, you had two minutes to talk, and whether you were the Russian uh, representative or a, a human rights activist from uh, Brazil, you get exactly the same amount of time to speak, which was quite interesting. And it worked. We managed to come up with a, with a um, roadmap, so-called, text from there, which some countries don't like, I have to admit, but uh, still... was not a UN event, so... Sorry.
maybe complicated. Um, okay, let's see. Any more any more questions? We still have some few more minutes if anyone would like. No. Can I, can I mention one issue Absolutely. that we haven't touched upon? Uh, that's uh, since we're talking about uh, co uh, arms control and so on. Uh, the issue that some uh, refer to as cyber terrorism. I don't know if you heard that expression, but uh, it's an expression I personally don't like very much. But it's um, uh, many countries refer to it, and some countries much more than others. And they like to the, the international cooperation on cyber issues. They like to focus a lot on fighting terrorism. Uh, and uh, then you have you you come into a lot of trouble immediately because one there is no definition of, of terrorism um, that we can agree on at least um, and two uh, some countries talk about the use of internet to promote terrorism for example mm -hmm. and not actually you know network operations where terrorists are hacking into some systems but uh, the use of internet and then suddenly you have a very very uh, thin line between uh, uh, freedom of expression and uh, promoting uh, illegal activities. And where is that line? Well, it's hard to say, but but um, uh, but it's not uh, it's not easy. For example, this this uh, conference last week that I referred to several times now, there was a, s a suggestion to to promote a text where the, where it said something like to destroy all dissemination channels of information of violent terrorism which is a very strong, at least in diplomatic terms, a very strong uh, uh, text, because it could basically mean that uh, we should shut down anything that we, the government, think uh, somehow uh, promotes terrorism. And what's terrorism then? If, are you a terrorist if you're doing yoga in a park in Beijing? I'm not sure, but uh, maybe. Good point, good point, absolutely. We have a question in the front row. Hi, I'm Lily Miller, I work here at NUPI. Um, my question comes back to what Miriam opened the discussion with and what we kind of touched upon during the whole session. And I'm interested, as we have someone from the state and an academic person, if we can come back to the question of how actually do we overcome this problem that the securitization of cyber lies with the private sector? And how do we... We've said that it's very hard because who is Google, but I was just wondering your actual thoughts of how to overcome this problem. Thank you. Uh, Good challenging question. You didn't get it? Not sure if I understood it. The, the, the problem of having private sector? or to <laughs> um, The problem is more that uh, the securitization of cyber lies with a lot with the private sector because 90% of the internet lies with the private sector. So mm. how do we overcome this problem or issue at hand? Was that more? Mm. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Who would like to start? Yeah, difficult, difficult. Lily asks the most difficult questions also this morning. <laughs> um, I think one of the issues is obviously, well, it's a decision of states. Uh, who should have the power to do what? And how can you make, if you're not happy with the power of the private sector, how can you take it away? Most states don't want to take away any power from the private sector because they believe in, you know, free liberal uh, market ideas, etc. But one of the things that I've seen is that many states now think about education a lot, which is a completely different field that we haven't talked about. But if you think security and if you think state needs certain things that they don't have, they're thinking about, you know, getting more people to become specialists in certain fields. And then the second question is obviously, and how will we get them? And that's another very diff difficult question because who pays more? It's usually the private sector or not. But that's one of the discussions that you can only start to actually, um, you know, uh, get power back if you have the people who have the knowledge. So either um, you start early in educating people in, in how to be more secure so that you actually start eliminating the problem much earlier in the behavior of people. That's one approach. Uh, also, you know, the, the awareness issue, that you need to make people aware of the issues. Um, if you know who takes what kind of data, you might start uh, behaving differently because there's usually things that you can click. If you install a new browser, for example, there's usually, you know, something that you can click, whether you want this thing to exchange information or not. So we have abilities to actually, you know, get some control over our data because there's a law uh, that helps us do that. But many people are not aware of that. Um, so that's another aspect. And states have tried to, to uh, actually have awareness programs. It's 
difficult though because uh, one of the you know talks is also in, at schools early, so you need to talk to kids very early. But who can do that? It's been a it's been an issue. I know that in Germany they have tried to get hackers to go talk to kids because they have a lot of credibility. They know a lot. Uh, and because many kids know much more than the educators about the technical environment. So if you don't meet, you know, with that type of knowledge, nobody will listen to you. So that's one of the issues there. And in terms of actually also getting specialized kind of people, um, cyber forensics, for example, is one of the fields that the, the law enforcement needs but doesn't have. There's very few cyber forensic experts in the world. They're usually in, in private companies and um, earn a lot of money. But uh, I, I know from a lot of police forces that they're actually now trying to find people within the force that have a knack for technology that they could, you know, uh, give an uh, extra education um, so that they can actually uh, do that very important, uh, yeah, forensic stuff in cyberspace without then having to, to use the, the private sector. But in the end, the, the, the state is obviously never going to, you know, get back the full power in this field. It's impossible. So it'll have to live with it. But I think there is a few things, and I think education awareness is a very important uh, field. And in the end, it's in the, the state has legal power, so a lot of it should, you know, actually work through, I don't know, data protection law and all these kind of stuff that we already have, but that we need to think about again, also in pushing back, uh, um, you know, certain practices of private companies that become very intrusive. That's obviously very clearly uh, uh, something that the state can do in actually saying this is going too far, it's not allowed. Or like the weird pricing thing. No, everybody pays the same price for a pair of trousers. It doesn't depend whether you're rich or not. <laughs> yeah. I think uh, there are three group of countries in this uh, related to this question. Uh, there are the, the, the countries that uh, would like to promote private uh, sector. There are the countries that uh, would not like to promote the private sector to such extent uh, that are more in favor of state control. And then you have the, the most countries in the world which is sitting on the fence and haven't really decided yet on which side they belong. Uh, all the developing countries, for example, most of them. Um, and I think um, um, uh, it, it, it's not a challenge to have the private sector. I think it's the, the opposite. I think it would be a much bigger challenge if we didn't have them. If the state were to sort of control this alone, because all the development, all the innovation, all the new thinking comes basically from the, from the sectors outside the state uh, or the government uh, systems. Uh, luckily, uh, it would not necessarily be a good uh, World Wide Web if the, if the governments were to decide how it should look like. But um, I think that the main job then is to convince all those sitting on the fence that by promoting a private sector innovation, you actually, it's good for them. It's good for the states. You know, it's not only, uh, it's not only they shouldn't be that afraid of losing control in cyberspace, that's my uh, take on it at least. So that's, that's sort of the, the way to over, overcome the problem, as you say, that's, uh, I think it's to, to convince countries that it's in their benefit to uh, not have a complete state control in cyberspace. Uh, yeah. I think that's my point. Good, excellent. States should be ready to well, accept they have to surrender some sovereignty also in this fair. I think that's it, we are at the end of the day, yes, end of the, of the session. Um, let's all give a big hand to our three speakers. <laughs> and we will continue to address different topics on cybersecurity next spring, so stay tuned. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah.